Thank you guys for joining me today um, to hear about our year two results from Seafood Progress. Um, in terms of housekeeping, we're recording this session and we'll be sending a link around to everybody so you don't have to worry about taking notes. Um, likewise, you can send it on to uh, colleagues who may not have been able to join right now. Um, I'll be presenting for about 45 minutes uh, with time for questions at the end, but if you do have questions, um, we fortunately just tested it and uh, I will be able to see them pop up and answer them kind of at the time. <clears throat> to recap, for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, Sea Choice, uh, we've been around for about 12 years um, working up in Canada. We used to work directly with uh, retailers in the form of partnerships and also do seafood um, rankings and recommendation using the Seafood Watch methodology, but um, about three years ago, we transitioned to be, being more of a watchdog role and started some new initiatives um, to kind of fill a hole that we saw in terms of seafood advocacy in Canada, because there were already some great organizations partnered with uh, retailers and doing rankings and recommendations. So we're um, a project of three organizations, the uh, David Suzuki Foundation, Ecology Action Center, and Living Ocean Society. Uh, which are all members of the Conservation Alliance. And um, as I said, we're no longer ranking seafood sustainability. Um, instead, we're engaged in some other initiatives uh, like market-based based approaches like seafood progress, um, working to increase sustainability of our priority species, um, which are uh, seafood commodities that are produced in Canada or imported that have significant environmental concerns associated with them. We're also aiming to improve the labeling and traceability of seafood sold in Canada, um, as well as engaging with the main eco labels that are relevant to the Canadian market. So that's just a quick recap of the type of work we do. Um, we're now gonna be jumping into what uh, this webinar is all about, which is what is seafood progress? Um, what uh, do the results tell us? Um, what have we learned about working with the retailers and um, doing these profiles over the last two years, and what is coming next. So, to start with Seafood Progress, if you've never had a look at the website, it has a, uh, a landing page with all of the uh, logos of the retailers we profile. They're the nine largest food retailers in Canada, and we first started working with them last year, um, developing profiles uh, according to the Seafood Progress Framework, um, which is based on the six steps of the common vision of the Conservation Alliance. And we turned the, the common vision, um, kind of operationalized it through the development of 21 key performance indicators that are spread across those six steps. Um, so the scores that we do for the profiles are initially based on the company's publicly um, available information, their public seafood commitment, um, and then we get in touch with the retailers, show them the draft profile, and encourage them to work with us to answer additional questions. So behind the scenes, the scoring is uh, quantitative, but it's only visual on the front end. We never provide any kind of numbers. Um, and retailers aren't ranked. We don't produce like a one to nine score of best to worst. Instead, their scores for every indicator um, and step are presented in relation to the national average. So just showing whether they're kind of above or below um, the current uh, national performance of their peers. So on the top left, you can see an example of the uh, infographic that's on retailers' main landing page that shows the uh, average score for each step in comparison to the national average. And on the bottom right is how we display the scores for individual steps and KPIs for the, in each individual indicator. So you can see new this year, um, we have two timestamps. So you can see both what their score was last summer and what it was this summer, and also how the national average has moved. Uh, so what have we found in the last year? What has changed in the past year? Uh, so this is the national average scores for each of the six steps. Um, we did find that the national average of all the steps and KPIs increased. And here on the figure, you can see how much they increased by compared to last year. Um, we also had uh, 
two additional retailers that worked with us in the past year to inform their profiles. So we're now working with eight out of the nine retailers that we profiled, which is great. Um, it's, we're happy to report that several of the retailers um, have shown huge improvements in their transparency related indicators, um, which is a huge aim of seafood progress. So that was great to see. Um, we've also kind of been increasingly realizing that the scope and ambition of commitments are critical to driving change in the supply chain. So it's something that's not explicitly scored in seafood progress. Um, and we'll come back to discussing that a bit more. All right, so we're now going to look at the um, trends and interesting headlines from each of the six steps, um, starting with step one, which is on commitment. Um, so this is what the scoring looks like um, in the back end uh, of my many, many spreadsheets. Um, now the scoring for these two KPIs are meant to be, are designed to be additive. So they go from a general commitment um, on environmental sustainability to a specific one, to one that includes references to credible standards, and then we bring in traceability. And finally, uh, a timeline for meeting their commitment is what's required. All of that is required to get 100. Um, now, when I was reviewing the retailers' uh, various commitments, I found it quite interesting that they were structured mostly in one of two ways. So retailers either focused on what they would source or they focused on what they wouldn't source. Um, and some did a little bit of both. And as a buyer of seafood, I found these uh, commitments to be the most helpful. So a commitment that says, you know, we aim wherever possible to buy eco-certified products, but, and we will never buy any red rank seafood or whatever. Uh, so the second indicator in this step, um, looks at uh, social responsibility and is structured in a very similar way. Um, I will say that last year we had a third KPI in this step, which was about having a commitment to traceable seafood. Um, but this year we incorporated the traceability element into the KPIs for the environmental and social commitments in recognition of the fact that traceability is a key element of meeting these commitments. Um, but we also found, we also did that because we found traceability applies across two different topics and that retailers generally had decent environmental traceability, but had far less developed capacity to track whether their products were meeting their social commitments. So that's another reason that we split traceability into and incorporated as part of the environmental indicator and the social indicator. Um, and after we did that, we found that only three retailers out of nine have social responsibility commitments that reference credible international standards, include clear objectives, actions, or expectations for their suppliers, have a clear and effective traceability policy, and a timeline for achieving their commitment. Uh, so in other words, despite this being a pretty high scoring step, only three retailers um, met, got 100 for their social responsibility commitment. Um, and this is what the scores look like across this step. Um, you'll see that I've anonymized the retailer name so that we don't get distracted by particulars. Um, but I have indicated which retailers were new to engage this year and which one didn't engage at all. So you can see kind of what effect that's had on their scores. Um, so yeah, step one is the highest scoring indicator, which is a great place to start in terms of what the, their commitments look like across the Canadian landscape. Um, however, as I mentioned, many retailers need to further develop traceability strategies um, to help them meet their social responsibility commitment. And some also need to continue their work on their like true due diligence. So not just um, taking their supplier's word for things, but actually requiring, requiring verification and or getting more involved themselves um, directly. In terms of commitment scope, I did a little analysis um, just for fun. And I found that um, over half of the seafood commitments don't include shelf stable products. Um, and that not all retailers banners are necessarily required to adhere to their commitment. 
And I wasn't able to find out how many retailers um, include national brand products as part of their commitment, which I also found interesting. Um, it's our view that the scope of retailers' commitments should really cover all of the seafood products they sell in their stores um, because they're all part of seafood. And I had a number of conversations um, with retailers, with you know, uh, the meat and seafood buyers where I asked them about canned tuna, for example, and they had no idea what they were buying, what they were selling, what their policy was on canned tuna because for them that was grocery and their meat and seafood and I just found that disconnect really interesting and also realized it's something that we'll need to focus on with some retailers to try and um, bridge that gap and make sure that all of their seafood is really um, falling under the umbrella of their seafood commitment. Um, because I think that's what consumers understand it to mean. That's certainly what I would assume. Okay, um, step two. Um, it's about data collection. So this looks at what information, like what key data elements retailers are collecting to support their seafood commitments. And the scoring for, this, uh, for these what, where, and how indicators is, uh, is pretty basic. They either are collecting the information for no products, some products, or all products. Um, now three retailers scored 100 for this, meaning that they're collecting all this information and probably more on all of their products. Um, and the retailers that scored less than 100 generally did so because they weren't collecting KDEs, uh, these KDEs on all of their products, but only on some of their products. And I didn't find a big difference in the types of information that retailers are collecting. I found that also kind of interesting. Um, kind of key takeaways from this step is that, shocking, data collection is critical to monitoring and reporting on your procurement targets because you can't manage what you're not measuring. Um, and although the national average scores did go up slightly compared to last year, um, this is mostly due to getting more information on practices from retailers that hadn't engaged last year and not because we saw a big change in retailer behavior or practices. All right, um, step three is a pretty important step on uh, responsible sourcing. So this is where um, we ask retailers like, okay, how, so what are you doing to meet your commitment, basically? Are you using um, seafood certification or ranking standards to inform your purchasing decisions? Um, are you tracking and can you tell us how much of your seafood sold is actually meeting your commitment? Um, and then what are you doing in terms of working with your suppliers? What are, what are your requirements for suppliers? And are they um, formalized in a code of conduct or vendor agreement um, to uphold that they will uphold your environmental sustainability commitment and your social responsibility commitment? Um, so here's what the scores looked like last year and this year for this step. Um, now, unfortunately, the conclusions about the overall direction of travel with this step are a little bit difficult because we changed the KPIs. So in 2018, we had a KPI that was on working with suppliers to address social responsibility. And we moved that because we realized it works better under a different step and that there was actually KPIs that work better here, which are the ones on the, having the code of conduct um, for suppliers to uphold their environmental and social commitments. And we made this change because we realized that it fits better and because through conversations with uh, retailers, we realized that although most retailers' agreements with their suppliers cover their environmental commitments, there's far more variability in whether social commitments are covered. Although, of course, one retailer bucked this trend and scored really highly on social and low on environment. So uh, it's just a trend. There's always an exception. Um, but importantly for this commitment, five out of, out of nine retailers have publicly reported on how much of their commitments in line with their policy within the last three years. And this transparency is really critical in terms of your sustainable seafood commitment because it proves that the retailer is tracking their performance against its policies and holding itself accountable to its organizational objectives. And of course, we recognize that the more ambitious a commitment is, the harder it may be to achieve, and also that a seafood business that expands the scope of its commitment, for example, by starting to include shelf-stable seafood like canned tuna in its commitment for the first time, 
may, at least in the immediate term, appear to be going backwards in terms of progress, which is why the context and scope of commitment tracking is also really important in terms of assessing businesses' impact on the water. And when we um, present all this, the indicator scores for seafood progress, we are more than happy to provide that context um, if, that explains changes in the scores. So our key takeaways from this step are that um, responsible sourcing incorporates environmental sustainability as well as social responsibility, and that these have to be underpinned by good traceability. Um, overall, the top performing companies in this step are top performing because they are publicly disclosing their progress against commitments and have codes of conduct with their suppliers that apply to their environmental and social commitments. And we're encouraging retailers to work with their suppliers or even ideally with producers as well to help drive the change that they want to see. Um, working towards a kind of full chain due diligence, um, which we hope would help address some of the, uh, in addition to having better due diligence and being kind of better um, peace of mind for the retailers, we hope would also help address some of the inequitable distribution of costs and benefits in terms of sustainable seafood production. Okay, so step four um, is focused on transparency, uh, an issue near and dear to many of our hearts, I'm sure. And the four uh, KPIs in this step are divided um, between kind of point of sale policy indicators. And uh, those are these two up on the screen now. So what is the retailer's labeling policy? Are they including information on um, species scientific name, its country of origin, so where it was actually caught or farmed and not just where it was um, processed, whether it's wild or farmed and what method was used to produce it. And are they including this information on any of their products, some of their products or all of their products? Um, additionally, are they um, using eco labels as appropriate so that consumers can identify eco certified seafood? Um, and then we have two kind of more typical uh, CSR indicators. So um, are retailers um, being transparent about the provenance of their products in terms of region and gear type data, um, for example, through Ocean Disclosure Project? Um, and also, are they reporting regularly on how much of their seafood meets their sustainability criteria? Um, so this indicator is slightly different from the one we discussed under step three, because this one isn't um, really scoring them on, on how much of their seafood meets their commitment, but on how regularly they're reporting it. So um, if they've never reported, then they get zero. If they've reported at some point in the past, they get 50. And if they're reporting uh, regularly, by which we mean every two years, um, then they get 100 for this step, for this indicator, sorry. Ah, so the scoring um, for this step went up by quite a bit compared to last year. Um, it was about a 50% increase actually. Um, and the biggest jump came from increased reporting against progress, um, seemingly due in part to seafood progress. So because we have these uh, indicators about disclosing performance against commitment, retailers are actually like publishing that more than they did and they're doing it more regularly. So those scores um, are going up. Um, but some of the scores on KPIs are very low. For example, 13 out of 100 for the KPI on publishing procurement info. Um, and some of them are very high, like the average for whether retailers are using eco labels on, um, on products inappropriate at point of sale is 94. So let's look uh, at the low one, one of the lower ones. So labeling practices, um, average score is quite low, 41, uh, meaning that most Canadian consumers don't have the information that they need to know what they're really eating, where it came from, or how it was produced. Uh, this is a good example. Cod, you don't really know whether it's Pacific or Atlantic. You don't know how it was produced, where it was produced. Um, and we're encouraging retailers to voluntarily include more of this key information since it seems that the Canadian government is not going to be raising the bar anytime soon. And fortunately, we've got a great um, 
leader on this in Canada who includes um, all of the, on all of their products, the common and scientific name, catch area or farm location, whether it's wild or farmed, and the method of production in both English and French on all of their private label and fresh products, um, which is something great that we can point to, to retailers who say this isn't possible, because it is possible. We're looking at it right now. <laughs> Um, two retailers have also shown great leadership in publishing the provenance information for a good um, section of their products. Uh, Metro through its Freshness You Can Trace initiative and Walmart Canada, which, very, uh, which this year joined the Ocean Disclosure Program. Um, and since you guys are probably mostly familiar with uh, ODP, we'll take a little look at uh, how Metro have done it kind of in-house. So if you go to Metro's website, they have it in English and in French. Um, this freshness you can trace product, they're kind of selling it as a traceability um, initiative. Um, although to me, it's more kind of public awareness and information. So um, they show you where to find the information on their seafood packages, like where to find the scientific name, where it's from, and the type of um, method of production. And then you can look on their website. Okay, it's a fish that I want to find out information about. Um, these are all the kind of different uh, products that they have information on. And say we want to find out about that cod. It tells you the scientific name, where it's caught, and the gears used to catch it. Um, so this is really great. <laughs> um, really great to see. Um, as well as, so this is a kind of a great uh, example for us to show other retailers that you don't have to go through kind of a pre-existing tool if you don't want to, you can do it your own way in a way that works for you and your business. Um, and kind of more broadly on this step, one of the main goals of Seafood Progress was to increase the transparency um, in this sector. And so we were really pleased that the average step score for transparency went up by so much. Um, to us, this shows that the re this means retailers are responding to their customers' demands for more information and more openness. Um, and for example, with this update to Seafood Progress, now seven out of the nine retailers have at some point publicly reported how much of their seafood meets their criteria. Um, and before we started Seafood Progress, that was only three. So that's a big increase. Um, although with the step, there's still significant room for improvement especially from the four retailers, which are still scoring less than 50 on this step. Yeah. Um, moving on to step number five on education. Uh, now internally, we had a few debates about the importance of education um, as a, a step in seafood progress. Um, but we decided to keep it in because uh, the majority of studies that we have come across show that point of sale messaging actually is a really good way to reach consumers. So whether it's through written communications or conversations with seafood staff. So we've continued to push for staff training and point of sale consumer messaging about retailers um, seafood commitments. Uh, we did change the third KPI though. Um, last year it referred to having a code of conduct for suppliers, as I said under step three. Um, and so we made a new uh, third indicator for this step because we realized there was a component of education missing, which was having conversations with your suppliers about your sustainable seafood commitment, um, both from the environmental and social angles. So we added that in this year. Uh, this is what the score changes uh, look like. Um, step five went from, I saw a 10 point increase compared to last year, so from 50 to 60 out of 100. And part of the reason for this increase is that the two additional retailers engaged with seafood progress um, in the development of their profiles and shared new information with us that justified increases in their scores compared to last year. Um, in terms of kind of trends on this step, five of the retailers profiled are conducting training programs for all of their seafood staff regularly, um, meaning at least every two years, while three conduct training for all staff, but less frequently. 
Uh, we feel like it's really important that seafood staff understand the basic seafood sustainability issues and the principles of the retailer's seafood policy so that they can accu accurately answer customers' questions and help them choose seafood that meets their needs. However, retail staff aren't always around or available to chat with customers about seafood options, which is why we also feel it's important that retailers provide written communications on their seafood policy at point of sale. Now this could include posters, pamphlets, or screens. Now currently only one retailer is providing detailed information on its seafood policies and stores, and four retailers are providing some information. For example, highlighting that they're an OceanWise partner and directing people to visit the OceanWise website for more information on the program. Um, here's what some of these uh, point of sale communications look like. Um, here's one explaining a bit about OceanWise and where to find more information. Here's one that explains um, what the retailer's policy is, the kind of basic tenets of their policy. Um, and this is the example I gave of Metro's Freshness You Can Trace program. They also have point of sale messaging telling you how to use um, the tool and where to find the information, which is pretty cool. Um, so really to summarize for this, for this step, we think that training seafood staff on store policies is really important so they can help customers um, it's great when retailers have information on their policy at point of sale, since this is where the majority of consumers will be making their decisions. Um, and of course, it's important that retailers work with their suppliers to meet their commitment, because um, this will help drive change down the supply chain. Okay, step six. Um, step six is structured a little bit differently to the other steps um, in that it looks at what retailers are doing to support improvements in particular seafood commodities, um, which is farmed Atlantic salmon, farmed imported shrimps and prawns, and skipjack tuna. And Sea Choice chose these commodities to focus on because they're sold in really high volumes in Canada, and because um, a significant proportion of the production of these commodities is. Uh, not recommended by OceanWise due to their environmental and or social uh, concerns. So there's a variety of actions for each of these commodities. They're all the same um, that retailers can engage in. Uh, some of the examples that have the potential to directly affect the supply chain include outreach to policy or decision makers, pre-competitive collaboration with other seafood companies, and or working directly with suppliers or producers. And some actions that we also included that um, may send indirect market signals include not advertising unsustainable versions of a commodity, preferentially sourcing eco-certified or eco-labeled products, and preferentially sourcing products with high levels of social responsibility and traceability. Um, so step six continued to be the lowest scoring step at national level although the average did increase from 20 to 33 out of 100. Um, I also developed an exciting new infographic for you guys um, that shows the kind of range of scores um, uh, as well as the average for each of the actions on each individual commodity type. So you can see the spread of scores for supporting improvements in farmed Atlantic salmon the range there, there is uh, 14 to 100 with an average of 43. And for sh shrimps and prawns, the range is 14 to 100 with an average of 44. For skipjack tuna, zero to 42 with an average of 16. And for other seafood commodities, the range is 14 to 42 with an average of 30. So really what this uh, graphic shows is that retailers are doing the least to support improvements in the production of skipjack tuna. And I hypothesize that this is because so few of their commitments actually include canned tuna in them, um, as if they're not a type of seafood. Um, and we've seen three retailers profiled that aren't engaged in any actions to support improvement of skipjack tuna, and three retailers are only doing one thing. Um, so our key takeaways from step six are that there's a bunch of different things that retailers could be doing uh, to engage on commodities that need improvement. And generally, they could be doing a lot more. Um, this step is really about encouraging retailers to be part of the solution, 
be active in improving the sustainability of the products that they sell beyond the more usual top-down pressure of telling their suppliers what they want, although of course that is important as well. Um, and we also strongly believe that producers need to be adequately, adequately rewarded or at least compensated if they're going to continue to invest or start to invest in practices that are more sustainable and responsible. So we also really want to drive that point home with retailers um, and that they need to do what they can to help ensure that the costs and benefits of sustainable seafood are shared equitably across all actors in the supply chain. Um, so I might pause there and see if there's any questions about the results of Seafood Progress before we move on to the next section of the presentation. Okay, well while you guys think of them, if there are any, the next couple sections um, are quite a lot quicker. But uh, what did we learn um, over the last two years and especially the last year of kind of returning to retailers and about what has changed? Um, so overall, the direction of travel looks good and we don't see any evidence of backsliding, although we do acknowledge that it is difficult to separate scoring increases that are related to better transparency from those that are related to actual improvements in actions. Although for us, both of those things are important. Um, as I've mentioned a couple times, the scope and ambition of commitments are essential for driving improvements down the supply chain, especially for the more difficult commodities. Um, seafood Progress currently doesn't score companies on the scope or ambition of their commitments, but these are issues that we're starting to draw more attention towards. Um, and finally, engaging with retailers, we think is important for three reasons. Um, one is that it makes the profiles more accurate and complete, um, so therefore it makes them more um, useful to the people who are using Seafood Progress. Um, it also leads to better mutual understanding of the issues, um, which is important for us, it's important for the retailers. Um, it also provided, like having these conversations with retailers about their profiles also provided an important opportunity for us to tell retailers about new tools and initiatives that they might not otherwise be aware of. Um, for example, the work that many um, Alliance members are doing uh, to develop tools or uh, other resources that retailers could and perhaps should be using. Uh, the conversations also were a good opportunity for us to better understand what retailers' barriers were to improvement or their concerns about improvement. Um, and that means that we can go away and see what we can do to help them overcome those barriers or address those concerns. Um, finally, What's next in the world of commitment tracking? Um, so uh, for those of you who sat in on the um, Conservation Alliance strategic update webinar the other week, um, you may have seen in the pre-reading that by the end of 2020, the Alliance is aiming to have developed and launched a global commitment tracking platform that's similar in aim and design to seafood progress, albeit with some differences in assessment and scoring. Sea Choice has been involved in this process through the advisory panel um, and we're currently comparing the two frameworks indicators to see where the differences are, whether they're significant, and we'll be offering our thoughts back to the project team and or advisory panel. Um, but both project teams um, will be in close contact to ensure that there's a coordinated approach and parallel strategy development. Um, because we want to make sure that we're working with each other and not against each other, because um, we're all really working towards the same thing. So yeah, that actually concludes what I wanted to tell you about today. Um, I'd love to hear any comments, questions, thoughts, feedbacks that anyone might have. Um, you can either raise your hand or I can unmute you and you could talk. I know it was a lot of information.
Okay. Well, unless anyone's about to speak up, then I will thank you for your time. Um, thank you for joining me. I hope you found it useful and interesting. And if you have any questions um, that you want to discuss with me in person, my contact information is on the screen. Um, I could chat about Seafood Progress all day long. Um, thanks, everybody, and have a great rest of your day.